So today we are finishing the series, Small Things, Big Difference. And we've talked over the last four, uh, three weeks before this, the fourth week, about different things that can move you forward in your life. Now, you might say, okay, John, you know, I've heard about this, but really, you look around and you see people who seem to make a huge impact in this world that have huge things going on and huge ideas, and you go like, well, that just can't be me. But here's the truth that I think we've talked about for the last four weeks that we want to share today. It's not the big stuff. It's often the small things that no one sees that result in the big things everyone wants. You just didn't see all those small things in their lives. You didn't see behind the scenes. Uh, we don't post this stuff on Facebook. Maybe we should, because the stuff we're posting isn't worth it half the time, right? It's the small things. So that's how we began this series and how we're going to end this th series, because we're talking about small things again today. They kind of build on each other. Now, the first week we talked about how we actually change, and a lot of people think that people change, and we try to get other people to change by forcing them to it, or by letting them know all the facts, just laying it all out, or even by putting the fear of God into them, you know? It doesn't work. Study after study after study. It's not those big things. Those power doesn't change people. What changes people, we are changed by the gospel, the gospel of God's love. We are changed through the gospel itself, the good news of Jesus Christ. As Jesus comes and relates to us on a very human, personal level that he is, do you realize Jesus is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh? That means he understands you inside and out better than you even understand yourself. And then he repeatedly comes again and again every day to pour out his mercies new to you every morning. And he reframes your whole life through his cross and resurrection. So you have purpose, meaning identity, destiny, everything going for you because you've got God on your side who could be against you, right? That's how we actually change. It's through the gospel. Now, in the second week, we talked about the power of our thoughts and how so often our thoughts become critical and negative and worrisome and anxious and all that stuff. And we kind of intimated this. I don't think I said it directly. Don't believe everything you think. I need to remember that many times. Don't believe everything I think. Just because it's a thought in my head doesn't mean I need to challenge my thinking at times and realize it's kind of distorted. It's full of all sorts of illogic. It's irrational. It's not even true. It's not based on the promises of God. So don't believe everything you think. And what we said is we need a focus for our thoughts. And that focus is the gospel, Jesus Christ himself. And when I focus my thoughts on him, everything starts to fall in line. Then last week, we talked about the small thing called our words. And we said words really do matter. Okay? Words really do matter. And if you really want to change the life that you have, you need to change the words that you speak. Okay? And God has spoken a word into your life. His name is Jesus Christ. The word become flesh. And that word has changed everything else. And what I need to do more often than not is to shut my mouth and let God speak his word over me. <laughs> right? I don't need to keep talking. I need to shut up and let God speak what he has to say. Today, we're going to talk about our habits. Now, how many of you would say you are a highly disciplined person? Raise your hand. One, two, three. Good for you. God bless you. You actually tried to raise your hand there, and then you shook your head at the same time. How many of you would say that not so much? Raise your hands. Now, be disciplined enough to at least raise your hand on this one, right? I get it. Now, here's something, though, that I want to reframe about the whole idea of habits. You still have habits. You have habits. We all have habits. There's a difference between having habits and having discipline, and we're going to talk about that a little today, OK? Um, 
Sometimes my habits are hitting the snooze button three or four times before I get up. Some other habits are I go home and sit on the couch and turn on the TV immediately. I don't even think about it. It's just what you do. After a while, that's what habits do. We've all got habits, and habits become powerful things. Now, Charles uh, Duhigg wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Power of Habit. And in it, he talks about the research that has been done on your life and my life, human life in general. He's not saying anything new in this book, but boy, he's selling a lot. And he's got a TED talk as well, OK? That's what happens. What he did find out, though, from the research he, he found and discovered that 85% of your day are habits. It's filled with all the habits that you do that you just automatically do. And it's a, probably a good thing, because we use less time when it becomes habitual. We don't have to think through it all. You know, we don't have to consciously go about, we kind of put our, at the beginning and at the end, we're fine, but in the middle, they find that during a habit, you're just kind of turning your brain um, into neutral for a while and, and not spending as much time or energy on something. That's a good thing. Some habits are great. Now, what he also discovered is this. He says, habits are powerful but delicate. They can emerge outside of our consciousness or can be deliberately designed. They often occur without our permission, but can be reshaped by fiddling with their parts. They shape our lives far more than we realize. They are so strong, in fact, that they cause our brains to cling to them at the exclusion of all else, including common sense. Do you got any of those habits? That is like, why am I keep doing this? This doesn't even make sense. This doesn't work. This goes against what I'd really, because it's habitual now. So we're powerful thought that we're going to be working on today is that I think you can change your habits into discipline. Now, what's the definition of discipline? This is it, OK? Discipline is simply choosing between what is comfortable now with what is ultimately best. OK? It's looking at kind of the end goal, a discipline. And we're going to get this right out of the Bible. We're finally going to get to our Bible verse today about what a discipline is. It kind of does beg the question, what's ultimately best? And I think Paul addresses that in, 2 Corinthians, or in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27. Okay? Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others I myself should be disqualified. So Paul here is using an analogy that everyone in the Greco-Roman world would understand. It's the Olympics. Now the original, not the modern. And the Olympics were held in Greece and continued athletic competitions to the day where Paul was and living. And the prize, do you know what the prize was? A laurel wreath. That's it. No gold medal. No silver, no bronze, nothing. The laurel wreath could last maybe a week. It's just a bunch of leaves start to fall apart. And yet, every athlete, he said, focuses on winning that prize. And they subsume everything in their life for the sake of that prize. You know how athletes, I mean, every moment of every day for an Olympic athlete is focused on the goal of that competition. And he says, so for you, for me, you have a goal. You have a purpose. You have an end goal in your life. You have meaning. You have significance. You can have a focus. And when you have a focus, you can have discipline. Otherwise, they're just habits. So today, we're going to look and take three little phrases out of this Bible passage from 1 Corinthians 9 and kind of run through them. The first is this, running aimlessly. That's what Paul said. We don't want to do that. I don't want to run at all. I don't know about you. But secondly is obtaining the imperishable. That's what we're going to receive. And then third, we're going to look at disciplining my body is what he talks about. So running aimlessly. What do you think? Most people are running aimlessly, but they're running. I've shared this before, and it's not in one of the slides, but um, Soren Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher, said life needs to be lived backwards. You got to know where you're going to know where to start and how to get there. 
okay? But if you don't look at that end goal, that focus, that prize, then everything you're doing is probably running aimlessly, just kind of spending time busy. Um, years ago, <clears throat> I read um, the novel by Brett Eaton Ellis called Less Than Zero. Anybody ever read that one? What? Seen the movie, I didn't see the movie. I don't know, the book was well written. It was his first novel and it deals with um, a main character named Clay, a rich young guy in college that comes back home to Los Angeles, okay? Um, for I think Thanksgiving break or whatever. And he's just, it's just one step after another of disillusionment with his friends, with his life goals, his purpose, with everything. And in that movie, there's this one scene I still remember, or not in the movie, but in the um, book, probably was in the movie, where Clay is in a car, and I think it's a convertible, driving through the desert, California desert, at a high rate of speed and style with his friend. And this is the dialogue that they say. Where are we going, I asked. I don't know, he said, just driving. But this road doesn't go anywhere, I told him. That doesn't matter. What does, I asked after a little while. Just that we're on it, dude, he said. You get it? I think a lot of people are just kind of on the road, driving fast and in style. And um, if that's the case, no wonder people struggle with their habits, because then your habits are probably formed for whatever is most pleasurable, whatever is most comfortable, whatever is easiest now. You eat your dessert now because there is no necessarily later. And so if that's the case, I'm going to be, when, if I'm running aimlessly, I'm going to struggle at getting any discipline in my life. But you aren't. Paul says you are not running aimlessly. You have been given a goal. You have a prize. You have purpose. You have meaning. You have significance. Every day of your life is filled with it because you are connected to the one who gives that meaning, significance, and life, Jesus Christ. And this is the way Paul says in our text that you and I, what we're going to gain is much better than what the Olympic athlete who's focused on that goal gains. He says, we're going to obtain the imperishable. Okay? Obtaining the imperishable prize, he says in that text. You know, athletes get that laurel wreath that lasts a couple weeks, and maybe they try to keep it for a long time. I don't know. But at some point in time, they probably threw it out because it just turned dry and dirty. You know, it's kind of like, who has still their wedding dress around here? Did you get rid of it? What? You've got it yet? Wow, good for you. My wife just donated it. I don't remember when. You know, and she said, yeah, it was great. It's like, she's not planning on getting married again, so that's good. <laughs> right? Not soon. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. OK, but um, Paul says those things are perishable. They only last for a short time. But you have an imperishable prize that is your focus. Now, what is that? And I bet a lot of you are saying, oh, I know, it's heaven. And Paul's doing everything he can to gain the gift of eternal life. And if that's the case in this passage, then it contradicts everything else Paul has ever said in 1 Corinthians as well as every other book. Because he says that is a gift of God. It's not something you work for, not something you have to strive after. It's not something that you do in order to get God to give you eternal life. Did you get it? He says you are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not a work, but a gift of God. So I don't think, and what we, if we understand the phrase that he uses to describe this, we'll understand what his real focus is and what his real prize is. Okay? <clears throat> because that understanding is religion, by the way. Religion is, I'm going to strive and work and discipline myself and do everything so I can gain eternal life. 
in whatever religion I've ever studied, and I'll be teaching it again uh, next semester at FGCU, and is that every religion in the world outside of Christianity says, you have to do all these things and go through these steps and meditate and follow these rules, whatever they are, this technique, and then you get it if you work hard enough at it. And if it doesn't work this time around, you'll come back and do it again and again and again until you get it. Paul says, no. No. You are already saved. You already have that. I remember a bumper sticker from the 1980s. I saw it. It said this, you tried religion, now try Jesus. Paul would say amen to that, OK? So Paul uses this phrase, actually. I do this for the sake of the gospel to share in its blessings. And what's curious about that is that Greek word for share really, um, well, it's a lot more to it in Greek than what we can do in English. So share does mean that Paul wants to share the blessings he has received in the gospel with everyone else and nothing to get in the way of that. But it also mean, it can mean the word participate. That is, I want to participate in the gospel. That I want to be so fully, ultimately immersed in the gospel of Jesus Christ, his love and mercy and grace, so that it just comes out of my pores. It just exudes. I smell like the gospel. I think like the gospel. I embody the gospel. His ultimate passion in life was that everything in his life would be so aligned with who Jesus was and what he did for them that his ultimate passion is to fully embody the gospel. You see, I think sometimes we think eternal life is this, this thing that you get to at the end. And while, you know, someday, you know, I'm going to die and then I'll have eternal life. But right now, my life is what it is, you know, and we're in the waiting game. And whatever you do, just kind of be nice. But it starts then. Um, and so, you know, Southwest Florida has been called God's waiting room. Have you ever heard that? And people are just kind of, you've never heard that. Well, base, why? Because people are just waiting and, you know, they've got a decade or two. And so in the waiting room, we're doing all this fun stuff, but we're just waiting to finally kick the bucket. Ah, oh, you knew that. You are so funny. But I dare say that eternal life has already started for you. This is how Jesus, when he prayed this high priestly prayer in John 17, just before he died, in John 17, verse 3, this is what he says. Jesus says, this is eternal life, that they know you, the Father. He's praying to the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know him. You have eternal life now. It might be a little on the messy side right now, but eternal life has already started the day that you believed. Okay? My hometown in Michigan was um, mission to the Chippewa Indians or Ojibwe Indians. And the people who settled that and left um, Europe to settle there came there specifically to try to missionize in 1845. And they had a motto. They said they wanted to live in such a way that they could show people how beautiful it is to live with Jesus. Do you understand that? That was their goal. How beautiful it is to live with Jesus. Not how beautiful it is one day when I die and I'll be with Jesus, but how beautiful it is to live with Jesus. And I believe that's Paul's goal and his ultimate passion, is to live with Jesus, in Jesus, because of Jesus, for Jesus, in such a way he is so Jesus-y that when you met Paul, you knew there was something more about him. And as a result, he was going to then discipline his body. That's our point three. He was going to focus his whole life on the goal of exuding and exhibiting and embodying the gospel. So that that's what his whole life was about. And Paul says he disciplines his body. And every athlete, he says, has self-discipline or self-command or self-mastery. And he used a unique Greek word here, egkrateia, 
means basically being in charge of yourself. And I think a lot of people try to do that. Paul kind of gives it a different twist here, a fascinating twist, OK? Because a lot of people try to live in control of their whole life. Do you know any control freaks around you? How's that working? You know? They want to control everything. They want to control themselves. They want to control um, the day. They want to make sure everything just fits in its place and everything is just perfect, et cetera. But you know what? If you try to, and, and the Greeks try to do this too, if you try to live in control, and you're going to live out of control because it'll only work so long. And you know, so I'm trying to live in control of my diet, and then Thanksgiving comes along, <laughs> or Friday night, or every day. I don't know, you know, it's just like we, and we yo-yo back and forth between trying to be in control and being out of control. And then we have all these regrets and we're trying to force ourselves again to have the right habits because we got these bad habits and to be disciplined, et cetera. But Paul says that is no way to ever be in control. No, the Christian life actually is when I am out of control and God is in control. It's much different than self-control. Paul says, think of the athlete. He has a goal. And when you have a focus, then things can start to fall in place. When you have an ultimate passion, and that's what Paul had in his life. He had his ultimate passion of being with Jesus and showing how beautiful it is to live with Jesus. And then everything else could fall in line because of that passion. You're not going to be able to think your way into good habits. You're going to love your way into them. So what was the definition of discipline again? It's discipline is simply choosing between what is comfortable now and what is ultimately best. Okay? And you can do that because of who considers you his ultimate best. You're his prize. You're his goal. You're his first love. You're the apple of his eye. That's how Jesus talks about you and me, and that's how we are. For God so loved the world that he gave everything in his son, his whole son, nothing back. Paul would say it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for the love of Christ controls us. And because that love is there, that love of Christ controlling him, then his habits can start falling into place. Then his disciplines start happening because he has something greater than himself to live for. So let's get a little more personal here, more practical. Think right now of a habit that you have that you've wanted to change because you realize it's just not that good. In fact, it doesn't embody the gospel. It doesn't promote the gospel. It seems to distance you or disembody the gospel. It's something like, gosh, I waste a lot of time at, or I'm just so focused on, and it just isn't a good focus. Whatever that is, think about that right now. Now, how are you going to change that, right? Thomas Akempis, a while back, said this. He said, habits overcome habit. Now, Thomas Akempis was a middle, middle medieval um, saint, I believe, or um, monk. And some of the things he probably did and said, are, this is a good one, though, let me tell you. I think this is good. Habit overcomes habit. In other words, it, for you to break a bad habit, you actually establish a new habit. Okay, And Charles Duhigg, in this book, The Power of Habit, said much the same. He says, but to change an old habit, you must address an old craving. You have to keep the same cues and rewards as before and feed the craving by inserting a new routine. In other words, a cue comes your way, and you want to just kind of veg out or whatever. It, I don't know what it is for you that you say, yeah, I, don't want to, I need to be more active, or I need to do this, or I need to do that, so that my, I change my habit. Whatever it is, choose what you do is you choose a different routine. You realize that God has actually satisfied whatever that craving is. 
that everything that you have in Jesus Christ satisfies your deepest needs and deepest desires so you can change that. You don't need this habit to feel good, but instead you replace it with a different one, whether it's like prayer, taking a walk, reading scripture, doing something for someone else. And then what I would like you to do, and what Charles Duhigg and what Thomas Kempis would say, and I give yourself a little reward at the end. For me, a little piece of chocolate will do. To say, okay, instead of sitting down and watching mindlessly another hour of TV, I did this instead. Great, fantastic. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to reward myself with a little piece of chocolate. And after a while, you won't even need the reward. I'm still going to take it. Is <laughs> what's wrong with a little piece of chocolate? Realize, I think, most importantly than anything here, Jesus is ultimately passionate about you. You're his focus. You're his prize. You're his crown. And he took a crown of thorns to give you personal, full, complete fellowship with his father. He was banished so you are welcomed. He died so that you live. He was forsaken so you are accepted. And when you start realizing the passion and love that God has for you, that can become the passion above all. That can become the focus so that every day of your life you're living purposefully. Do you realize that there is not one day that God gives you that cannot or is not actually filled with meaning, purpose, significance? He even says this. Jesus says, even a cup of cold water given in my name lasts into eternity, makes an eternal difference. Even the simplest little act has eternal significance done in Jesus' name. You know the word passion itself, like, you know, passionately in love, the word passion itself in the Greek is the root for suffering. It's what he suffered for you, his passion. That makes all the difference. That's the focus. Small things that can make a big difference. Habits, words, thoughts. The big difference that Jesus made for you can make even our small things important. Let's pray, okay? Lord Jesus, thank you for this series to remind us again of the big things that you did in your life, even though they look to some insignificant, Lord Jesus, just the fact that you showed up, that you wanted to be with us, that you wanted to relate to us, that you repeatedly have loved us, you have repeatedly come to us every day of our lives. We thank you for that, Lord, and how you reframe everything in our life, how you give us a new direction and hope and purpose and meaning, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that. We pray that you would inspire us by your passion so that we can make the small changes in our lives, the words that we speak, the thoughts that we hold on to, the focus of our lives, even the habits, that you can change the habits so they become holy habits, habits that embody your gospel more to others. Lord Jesus, there may be people here who have intellectually and formulaically heard about who you are, but I want you to know them intimately and that they would intimately know you today and have eternal life. I ask that you would just open their hearts now to receive you fully, Lord, and that we would all open our hearts and lives to prepare and receive you as you come to us, Lord, in amazing ways. And as we celebrate, Lord, the, uh, your supper that you instituted on the night you would be betrayed today, we pray, Lord, that you give us faith to trust you and to believe in you, and to receive all that you are. And bless us, Lord, as we do so. In Jesus, your name we pray. Amen.